Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I have on the show with me regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser. Hey, Emily. Good morning, Olga. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving and a huge welcome to Wyndham County Senator Becca Ballant, who is also the new Senate Pro Tem for the state of Vermont. Hello, Becca. Good morning, Olga. Good morning. And just just to be clear, it won't be official until oh. January. But given that our caucus has 23 <laughs> out of 30 senators, it's it's all but assured. But I just I want to be clear. Okay. Not official until I get sworn President in. Tempore elect. Exactly. Um, although I have to say, given how this session kind of sort of didn't end and everyone's work is kind of sort of still going, I suspect you're already starting your pro tem. Yes, indeed I you? am. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. And actually, I want to give a shout out to uh, the woman who's gonna be serving as my chief of staff because she is also a Wyndham woman. So Carolyn Wesley will be serving as uh, my chief of staff and those locally may know Carolyn from um, either Building Bright Futures or Energy Action Network. She also served in the Shumlin administration. Her mother is Julie Peterson who okay. was a house rep and also served in the Dean administration. And so wow. Carolyn, uh, she literally um, spent her earliest months and years running through the state house halls. So um, and she went to Green that... Street Elementary School and she still That's remembers right. the school Just like... songs and we'll sing them for you anytime you ask. So if you're coming through the state house and you're also a Green Street alum, stop by the office and she will just break right in for you. Right. And my, my kids also attended Green Street. So it's, it's a, a beautiful symmetry there. And um, I got an email the other day from one of her mother's best friends who was um, really very encouraging of me in my career. And she said, this is so exciting. The women of Wyndham. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so great. So now we have it. a secret. And, you know, exactly. And the best part really for me is that all, all kidding aside is I'm delighted that there are on the Senate side, the folks who are in leadership on the Senate side are all people from Southern counties. So you've got Windsor representative, you've got Rutland. It does make a difference. And I, I really want to make sure that we have our focus on rural Vermont and how we're gonna be supporting those communities going forward. Because I know Emily has heard me say it many, many times, but for folks who may not know it, if you look at an economic health snapshot um, of Vermont and you pull out Chittenden County, things do not look so rosy. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. all living that on the ground, so. Yeah. Um, for listeners who may not have this context, one reason, at least in my opinion, it's significant that we have so much leadership from uh, the southern part of the state, um, as Becca mentioned, is that sometimes you look at state task forces or committees, yeah. um, and it's really not uncommon to see that there's no one right. from this from southern Vermont. And so it can feel sometimes when you're in southern Vermont that you're being left out of the decision making. Right. Um, you know, and there's a couple reasons for that, Olga. Um, one of which is prior to the pandemic, right? None of these meetings happened over Zoom. Right. They were all meetings in person. And so actually the one real upside of this terrible time is that I see a lot of opportunities for government to be more transparent mm -hmm. and more collaborative because we are able to have people participate that are not in such um, close proximity geographically. And Emily, I'm sure you've thought about this. We talked well. about it a little bit last week, but we actually yeah. really have been making an effort over the last, are we six months, seven months? Where are we in nine months? However far into this we are, we are in, we've been making a real effort to say like this, you know, this is an opportunity 
in right. this difficult time. Like this is one of the ways we're going to emerge stronger from this period. Right. And right. absolutely. I mean, even when I look at the climate council, um, mm -hmm. the appointments have much more Southern representation than I think they would if people had to drive there. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm see, you know, one of the folks from Wyndham County, Abby Course, who is on the commission, yeah. you know, dairy farmer, parent of young children, she would have an incredibly difficult time getting to Montpelier for regular meetings, but over Zoom, she's able to really participate fully. Mm -hmm. So speaking of leadership, uh, Becca, now that you have stepped in, you're stepping into this new role, have you been thinking of leadership and what it means and the type of leader you want to be? Yeah, and, and the thing is, Olga, I've been thinking about this for years, <clears throat> not just in the context of pro tem or majority leader. Um, what some folks may not realize is I actually lead authentic leadership trainings and workshops. It's something that I've been doing for, for some time. And it all comes back to my belief that the base on which you build great leadership is personal relationships. And I see that so clearly in my everyday life and I see how it translates into this, this role in, in the Senate, which is, you know, leadership really rarely comes down to grand gestures, right? You have to establish rapport and connection with people at every step of the way. So it really happens in these tiny little moments between people. And I'm delighted that I have an opportunity to continue on the work that I did as majority leader. One of my main goals coming in was making sure that everybody within the caucus had an opportunity to be heard. And that really was not the case when I first um, was elected to the Senate. It was a very contentious space and the loudest voices got heard. And like literally, not just metaphorically, but like literally shouting over each other. Wow. And, you know, I remember thinking to myself, this, this is not good governance. <laughs> this yeah. is not, you know, we all we all run the same way back in our home districts. You've got to get people to vote for you, right? You got to do the, the retail politicking. So you're being sent there by your constituents because they believe that you have something to say. And then if you enter an environment in which your voice doesn't seem to matter, that is just absolutely uh, a, a perverse way of looking at representational government, right? That some people, by sheer force of will, by how loud their voices are. By how and by long they've been there. By, by institutional power, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I wanna be clear that I do know that people who have been there a while actually bring something really critical to the table, the institutional memory, understanding how government all fits together. But also they can sometimes be really entrenched and not have a sense that change is possible, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I've been thinking a lot about how, I'll tell you a story, I'll, you'll appreciate this. So um, in my first session, um, I, I had a conversation with a reporter, a state house reporter, and he and I had been developing a rapport and he pulled me aside one day after um, a committee and, and he said, oh, you know, can I grab a few minutes? You want to talk about an issue? But then at the end, he sort of hung around and he, he said, um, I'm really worried about you. And I said, why? And he said, I'm worried about you because you lead from your heart. You lead, you know, with this, this open hearted um, uh, compassion for others. And I just feel like people who come into this building like that get crushed. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. he said, he said, I'm afraid you're going to get crushed or you're going to turn into a real jerk. And he didn't use jerk, he used a word that I'm not gonna use right now, but he said, I see this happen to people. They come in here with so much hope and possibility and they feel like they can't make the change. And so they either become embittered or depressed, despondent, and they leave. I had a lobbyist say the same thing to me my first, Yeah, like, I think my first month, two months. Um, yeah. 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 And and I, you know, I said to him, you don't have to worry about me because I know exactly who I am. And that's what allows me to do the work in the way 
that I want to do it. I know it's true for Emily as well. Like you have to know at your core who you are. So even when things don't go the way that you want them to, you know that your self-worth is not wrapped up in a particular mm -hmm. task or a particular moment, right? That it is part of a continuum of experience. And so it's and funny think, whenever I, go ahead. Em. I think having, um, and it's separating your ideas or your ideas from your community, from your ego. Yeah. And that if something, you know, succeeds or fails, you know that you are part of a shift, but not necessarily the one who held this whole thing. And so if it doesn't, that's right. If your community, you know, if your idea doesn't make it across the finish line, that doesn't mean that you are harmed personally. That's right. It might mean that your community was harmed, but it doesn't mean right. that you personally were harmed. Um, right. And, and I really feel like we're on the cusp and like really we've taken a step into this already of a very different way of understanding what happens in the state house and what happens in government. You know, we there's a story in the building that all decisions are made by four to five people. And certainly those people have a lot of positional power and a lot of um, institutional power mm -hmm. that the people who have been in the building the longest or the loudest or have the strongest forces of will or the most connections are the only ones who get to speak. But I already see that shifting, um, that it's not, you know, having pro tems and majority leaders and speakers who don't feel that it's their job to command, control, and punish, but instead facilitate people's skills and strengths is a real, it's a real incredible opportunity for the people of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm still looking forward to it. You know, what you've been saying, Becca, reminds me of a conversation that Emily and I had with John Hagen mm. over the summer, where we were talking about power and how it so often gets carried out in this country as a form of competition and that leadership is a form of competition mm -hmm. and you know what you just said now about leading from your authentic self it's just so refreshing mm -hmm. it feels much more open and has a greater sense of possibility rather than that you know king of the mountain um version of leadership that i think mm -hmm. so often we're used to seeing yeah. Did you I play think that really... game when you were a kid, Becca? Did I play King of the Mountain? Yeah. Uh, we played all kinds of things. Yeah. Like even like beat the crap out of each other. Like. <laughs> well, that's basically King of the Mountain. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was pretty scrappy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what's that? I want to make sure our listeners know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, the thing is, Olga, that. It, it is more hopeful. It is about, um, it is being inclusive in a really meaningful way, not just like, you know, sort of letting people in, right, to, to have their peace, but truly seeing leadership as a conduit for others, right? And so I love that so many people in the last week have reached out to me from around Vermont, men, women, Democrats, Republicans, queer people, people from other marginalized communities who are feeling a sense of hope and possibility because they feel like they have been on the outside looking in for so long. And I really resisted feeling sort of the weight of that, that symbolism of, the first woman, the first queer person. Um, but in the last few days, I've realized I need to get more comfortable with it because it's so powerful for so many people. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason why I've been resistant, resistant to it is because there's a tremendous amount of weight that comes along with that, right? Like, I don't wanna screw up, you know? And then I just have to remember if yeah. I am my authentic, I will, right, right. I will. <laughs> I will screw up and I will own it, right? But that when you approach leadership as really a collaborative effort, it also takes oh, off some of the pressure too, right? That we are all gonna bring our best work and our best ideas. And it isn't about me leading from in front, right? It's about me really bringing folks 
along and, and lifting up those voices of people who either have more experience or have a different perspective or um, are, are representing a community in rural Vermont that we desperately need to hear from. So to, to, I see my job is trying to amplify those, those voices. One of, the symbolism I think is really important in one other way um, and worth sitting with in that, you know, I've heard you tell a story a number of times about when you were growing up, Harvey Milk was the only yeah. out yeah. politician that I knew of either. Yeah. And yeah. when we were growing up um, and he was murdered. Yeah. And the fact that you could be a symbol of someone who's alive and real and flawed and compassionate. It's not just about, you know, not being murdered, but it's about thriving in your beauty and your flaws and your realness. And that is so much more relatable yeah. to people coming up who also have, you know, everyone has struggles and to see someone who's willing yeah. to be vulnerable in those struggles in a position of leadership is, it's so much easier to see yourself in that person and your own possibilities when that's available. No, you're absolutely right. It is, it is about being able to picture yourself and yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Emily. I think, you know, you know me so well and you've, you've heard so many of my sort of origin stories that I forget how, how some, in some ways how important they are, but that, you know, when you know at such a young age that you are supposed to do something, that you feel a calling. And I, I absolutely felt that in my, um, in my high school years. And to then have to put that aside and feel like that's not going to happen in my lifetime. I absolutely believed it would not happen in my lifetime that we would make so much uh, change in the way that um, we see how LGBTQ people, you know, are in the fabric of our communities and have been always, right? But but now we're able to speak more honestly and openly about that. And you know, I. I never thought I'd get here. Mm -hmm. I really didn't. And so to come to that decision after I graduated from college and then go into teaching, um, not so much by default because I loved, I loved teaching, teaching social studies and history, but, but feeling like I'm not doing the thing I felt like I was put here to do. It's very painful. And that right now it's really beautiful, which is part of my elation is feeling like I didn't think I'd ever get here. And here I am. What shifted for you to, and, and I, I'm glad you were a teacher too, because I suspect it's your years of hurting small children <laughs> is going to help you herd. <laughs> Oh, they were middle school students. Oh, middle school. Oh, even better skills. Yes. Um, so I suspect teaching is going to hold you in very good stead. But yes. um, what shifted for you? Did you mm -hmm. find other people gave you permission to take this step? Did you need to shift something inside of you mm -hmm. to, to step into your, mm -hmm. your role in, in um, politics? Yeah. So... Um, couple things. One, I had my son. And when you have a child, uh, you just see your life in really different ways. And actually, I'll tell this story. Um, Abe was just a few months old, and I was up in our bedroom, and I was nursing him and, and my wife came in and I was just crying, crying, crying. And um, that summer I had applied to a principal certification program and I was supposed to start that, that fall. And she said, why are you crying? What's the matter? I said, I don't want to be a principal. I don't want to be in administration in schools. And she said, great. I don't want you to either. What's going on? I said, I don't know. I just feel like I, that's not what I'm supposed to do next, but I don't know what the thing is. And so that was like, that was a tremendous moment of permission that she gave me of just like, oh my gosh, no, fine. 
let's put it aside, you know, withdraw your name, don't need to go. And then shortly thereafter, I met someone who has been a long time mentor to me now. It's been um, in January, it'll be nine years. And it was someone I met quite by chance at a New Year's Eve party. And she was uh, a good friend of a friend of mine. And it turned out she was a professional coach. And um, we actually spent the afternoon sledding together um, with my with my children. And, and she was a um she was a coach and a musician and an actress and and i wanted to know more about coaching and i said what does that mean like when you say that you're a professional coach a life coach what does that mean and like it just seems so touchy-feely but she was not a touchy-feely person at all like at all and she said well you have a really different sense of what this is and why don't you why don't you hire me for a session in january and just see see what you think and through that relationship, I actually went and got certified to be a coach as well. Did a, a year-long intensive program and coached clients and coached groups. And through my relationship, both as a coach and having her working with me, um, really forced me to look at what it was that I still wasn't doing in my life. And so she, probably more than anyone forced my hand and she said I want you to get on the phone and I want you to apply to the women's campaign school at Yale and I was like I'm not doing that <laughs> she was like no you're doing that so I get online and I look at the the application I was like oh thank goodness I missed the deadline right so I, her up. I was like I was like I missed the deadline she was like so what I was like what do you mean so what she's like you get on the horn and you call them and you find out if there's a waiting list. And I was like, no, I don't do those things. I don't do those things. She's like, no, you're going to do this because you're not going to look back. I'm not letting you look back and say, why didn't I do the thing I was called to do? So I called up the woman. I said, I missed the deadline. I know I missed the deadline. I'm sure it's too late to, you know, apply. What but think who I am. Right? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Please say no to me. Please give me permission to not do this. And she's like, look, you know, it's a get your application in. I'm certain like we have a really long waiting list. I'm sure like you're not going to you're not going to get in. And, um, you know, it's really just like, go ahead, like knock yourself out, honey, if you want to do this. So I scramble it, scramble, get it all together. And my recommendations were so phenomenal and that's because they were from people who knew me so closely and had had taught with me for years in schools that this woman called me back and said look you are a great candidate if something opens up we're gonna find a slot for you and I was like whoa and then it did and then it was literally like two weeks later I had to go to Yale for this intensive program and you know thank goodness I have a spouse who's like okay like, we'll figure this out because our kids were so little then, so little. Mm -hmm. This is a long story, much longer than I thought when I launched into it. But that's really what did it for me was attending campaign school at Yale and meeting women from across the political spectrum, because it's open to, to any political stripe from across the world, not just the nation. And I actually ended up rooming with a woman who was uh, a congressional staffer from Kentucky and um, met a lot of really interesting women on both sides of the aisle. And two days ago when um, the woman who runs the campaign school saw my announcement about pro tem, she reached out to me and she was like, this is amazing. Congratulations. I was like, it's all for you. Like you, you saw something in me and I'm so grateful, but that's, that's really, it was, it was a combination of, of people believing in me at a time when I, I, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't think it was possible. Yeah. Wow, Becca, thank you. We have just a minute or two before we have to go to break. Okay. Any, bef before we hear from some of our underwriters, any last minute thoughts on leadership you want to leave people with? Well, one thing that I've really tried to convey in the, the leadership 
workshops and trainings that I do is we all have the potential to be strong leaders, whether it is in our, um, in our offices, in our, um, in our communities. And it's not, again, it's not about the person who's the loudest or the person who's the best organizer. It is those, it's those people who day in and day out bring their, their best selves to make a personal connection to people. And I gave a sermon last week at Mount Mansfield Unitarian Church, and we had a really, I know you're laughing at me. I'm so sorry. Um, I know I should have. You should have laughed. Know, it was really laugh. beautiful. I know, I'm so sorry. Yeah. But so <laughs> at the end, we had a, a chat about the sermon, and so many people within the congregation said, I'm so grateful that you talked about what leadership looks like, what democracy looks like in terms of our interactions with our neighbors. And so um, when we bought our house here in Brattleboro, the man who lived across the street from us, every time he opened up his garage door, we saw the giant take back Vermont sign. And it would have been really easy to just like shut off any sort of attempt at personal connection to him, knowing that he was someone who truly believed in fighting against civil unions and then same-sex marriage. But we didn't, and day in and day out, we made the effort as neighbors. And that makes a difference, not just in our relationships with each other, but how we are talking to each other across political difference in this nation. It's person to person, those, those, those open conversations with each other, just as neighbors, that's where it starts. Senator Becca Ballant, thank you so much. We on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, the Montpelier happy hour, we'll be back in a moment. Got my cup, no cups. <laughs> Welcome back to the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters. And if you're just joining us, I am speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three reps for the town of Brattleboro to the State House, and Wyndham County Senator Becca Ballant, who is also um, pro tem elect for the Senate going into the new session. Welcome back to the show, both of you. Um, and I wanna make a note for those of you who are not watching us on Facebook Live, Becca um, was talking about the campaign season and how much um, the debt of gratitude that we owe to so many black women who made a difference in this campaign, especially with uh, making sure we didn't get four more years of Trump. So thank you for reminding us of that, Becca. Looking ahead to the legislative session for both you and Emily, what do you think are some of the really key issues on your plate right now that, that you're gonna need to dive into in January? So first and foremost, continued pandemic relief. That is, the most important work that we'll be doing uh, in the Senate. And if we don't get another federal package of CARES relief funding, we are in dire straits, Olga. And um, it's something that's weighing heavily on my entire caucus and I'm sure on the minority caucus as well. We continue to hear from Vermonters who are really, really struggling and as we head into the winter and our numbers continue to rise, very concerned about what that's gonna mean for people who perhaps were unemployed and then were able to get back on, uh, you know, get back to work and now perhaps once again, will we'll lose their jobs. We have, that. that is the most important thing that we're gonna be doing. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure Emily has some, some thoughts on that too. And then we can talk about some of the other priorities, but I just wanna really, um, reassure Vermonters, we know that this is the most important work that we're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, 
when that money comes and if it comes, it's going to be really important because the last package of funding had to be spent according to federal regulations by the end of December. So that's next month. And so I'm really concerned, you know, we have a lot of unemployment benefits are going to be expiring this month Mm -hmm. and next month. We have, um, including, you know, the bonuses that have already expired. There's the food program. There's so many of what, you know, Vermont's done a fairly good job at relief compared to a lot of states, still far from perfect, still a lot of people struggling, but so much of that, um, the way the federal package was structured, there weren't a lot of opportunities for an easy off. Um, The legislatively, when we put in place, say eviction moratoriums or utility moratoriums, those were set to expire some period after the state of emergency. So those are really tied to the length of the pandemic, but the funding is not. And so things get tighter and tighter and making, we've talked so much on this show about making decisions in an environment of tight pressure, both time and otherwise. And so I know that the decisions we made about how we spent that first package of money was really informed by this intense time pressure. Um, And so I'm hoping that while we wait for the Biden administration and Congress to figure out what this next aid package will look like, we're able to do some advanced planning so that when it comes, we can be a little um, Mm -hmm. more proactive so that we're really funding our future and not funding Mm -hmm. some memory of our past. Mm -hmm. Well said, Uh, yeah, I like that. (laughs) One thing too, Olga, that I wanna just remind folks of or, or, or inform them in case they don't know is that our hands were very uh, much tied in terms of what we could spend the money on and what we couldn't. And there were many voices in Vermont that wanted a huge investment into uh, broadband infrastructure for our ongoing economy's health, but also now that we are in the pandemic uh, for education, for Mm -hmm. telehealth, for all of these reasons. And we were really limited in what we could spend the money on related to broadband build out. You literally had to use the money to get people's service by the end of December. It couldn't just be in the pipeline, right? It had to be for for services rendered, right? And and that was really, really disappointing because of course, all the struggles that we're having right now are related to the pandemic. So they, they did this very weird sleight of hand saying you had to spend this money on pandemic relief Um, but the fact that everyone is home now trying to work from home and trying to do schooling from home and trying to do telehealth from home, somehow that is not directly related to pandemic or pandemic relief. And so, you know, we've been really clear with our congressional delegation that we need more flexibility and funds. And I know that senators Leahy and Bernie Sanders and our Congressman Peter Welch, they fully understand that. And of course they are three voices, you know, within the Congress Mm -hmm. and it is, it's critical for so many states that we have more flexibility in how we can spend any additional funds. Yeah, it, I always found the federal aid package interesting because while there were some immediate crises crises created Mm -hmm. by the pandemic, a lot of them were actually linked to problems that existed in in our system before. And so to recover from the pandemic, we actually need to fix longstanding problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And and so it's it's a great segue into talking about what are some of the other things that we'll be thinking about is uh, it's easy to go back and be able to identify them. As, As Emily always says, it's like, it's the cracks in the system already, right? So many more um, investments in housing, in a childcare system that, that really works, in an early education system that works. And um, of course, continued work on the climate crisis. And specifically, as we think about 
how it impacts rural Vermonters, especially we're looking at hopefully a sort of supersized weatherization program that um, many people within the climate caucus are talking about. And again, related though, very much related to how are we going to pay for heating our homes going forward if we don't do this, this investment now? Other things, Emily, that you're, you're thinking about? Um, we've certainly talked um, about opiates and mm -hmm. sort of trying to really, it's you know been a decade, I think, more since the hub and spoke model was created. Um, and so what does that mean? How are things shifted since then? What have we learned about evidence-based practices for keeping people alive? Mm -hmm. um, and certainly that's a big issue for Wyndham County and helping our colleagues understand that it's not just a Chittenden County issue and issues in Chittenden County are different. And I think we're really well positioned for that. Um, continuing to work on reproductive justice with Prop 5 coming around again, mm -hmm. um, that's gonna be really important. Um, and then I think in addition to childcare, really what we've come to understand about the need for other social benefit programs, right? So whether that's re-looking at unemployment insurance to make sure that it works for more Vermonters than it does, um, looking at family medical leave again and temporary disability insurance, but really the pandemic again illuminated all of these places where so much of our lives depend on frontline workers, their abilities, their rights, their, you know, their capacity and folks who participate in care, you know, the caring economy, we could call it, or unpaid labor, but, and mostly women and a lot of single mm -hmm. mothers, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. if we, like, more people understand that that's what everything else sits on, to me, that seems like we have a real opportunity for continuing to really invest in the rights of those workers and the needs of those folks who are engaging in caregiving in whatever capacity they need. What about, you know, there was a little talk at the end of the session and um, I'm sure it will be at the front of the session too. You know, this conversation about how are we going to be funding the budget mm. and revenues and everything like that since since things have been kind of tossed up in the air. And of course, Vermont gets so much money through tourism, which has also been tossed up into the air. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What about conversations around economics and the budget? Well, first I just want to, the revenues are not as down as catastrophically as they were, people thought they would be. Um, and that is again, because we know that the pandemic hit the economy in a really divided way for people. And so there are a lot of people with a lot more extra money than they had before because mm -hmm. they aren't say eating lunch out every day or going on vacations or whatever it is. And so those folks are, a lot of people are starts maybe spending more money on renovating their house or buying couches or whatever people with extra money do. Um, and so in, and you know, I think some people are getting takeout more often, whatever it is, but the revenues are not down as terribly as we thought they were. They are certainly down. Um, and certainly there's a shift from meals and rooms, um, but you know, we know liquor sales went up for instance. <laughs> so as re revenues have shifted, and then you know, there's certainly talk about a Snelling surcharge or something like that, that was floating around at the end of the session. And I think we'll come back as a conversation. Um, and that's a, sort of a temporary tax on um, the wealthiest Vermonters to really help mm -hmm. us through a difficult period. That was a completely bipartisan approach during the last recession under Governor Snelling, a Republican. Right. Um, and then we're also receiving back a report from um, tax commission, which was really supposed to look mm -hmm. at the structure of our taxes. And so when we began conversations at the end of last session, I think a lot of them paused waiting for whatever report this commission is going to come out with. And that's going to be likely a conversation about property taxes, around how we fund schools, um, the waiting study, which we've talked about previously on this show. Mm -hmm. What else, Becca? When, when is that report due, just out of curiosity? 
January, February? Probably do the probably the January fifteenth, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I don't know for certain, but that's generally when when those blue ribbon commission reports Which is are due. So hard because if they were due, say like December fifteenth, there would be time to read them before you started doing everything else. I don't know why we do that. I find it very frustrating. So <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> That's like a topic for another day. Is no. that a lot, a lot about, I mean, what I mean by that is, so I'm waiting on a report too, that is particularly um, important to folks here in Brattleboro who are connected to BCTV. We're looking long-term mm -hmm. about the health of our, our PEG TV um, channels and the health, financial health of them. And because of the pandemic, Yes. So many, so much of the work that needs to be done in order to develop those reports, it's, it's not going to be done in time. And it's mm -hmm. nobody's fault. Everybody's oh. flat out. And, and so it's just so funny. I just had a meeting with folks from ACCD and they were like, we need more time. I'm really, really sorry. And I said, I get it. How, mm -hmm. how can you, how can you, you know, possibly pull this together in the midst of everything else that's on your plate? not the least of which is getting hundreds of millions of dollars out the door from CARES funds to, to, to businesses and organizations around the state to keep them open. And so. it's not just reports from the administration that are um, gonna have a really hard time being ready this, at the beginning of the session. It's also so much of the work we do to prepare for legislation for an upcoming biennium is done right. through study committees. Um, yeah. Or informal things like study committees, which is, you know, a whole bunch of people getting together and taking the time to go deep into a topic and come to yeah. some form of agreement before it comes up in a committee, because committees don't have time to go that deep. So I think some people joke that study committees are really just a way to punt an issue and not deal with it and pretend you are. But in fact, that's how you spend the time needed to wrestle with a difficult issue that there is never time for during the session. And so all of the off session joint committees and study committees and studies only had a month this year. And mm -hmm. all of us only had a month this year to really take a break and relax and go back to our regular jobs and learn how to like each other again and all the things that generally we have six months for. So it's gonna be, there's gonna be some really interesting um, impacts of that very short break on how the biennium unfolds. Mm, yeah. And, and so I wanna go back to an idea that Emily brought up that is a really important one for people to, to wrap their head around and thinking about our, our economic challenges. So about 22 million jobs were lost um, over the course of, um, the pandemic nationally. So from, from March until, until just recently, 22 million lost. We regained um, about 12 of those, 12 million of those jobs. Hmm. But again, like we're heading into another dark period of the pandemic. So we may, we may lose some of those. So and we also don't of the 10. Wait, can I just jump into that for one second? The, what has happened in every other recent recession is that the jobs gained are never as good as the jobs lost. Right. Um, and so I think that's really, you know, I think especially in Vermont, we might have people who are working 45 hours a week who are now working 25 hours a week um, mm -hmm. and pieces like right. that. And so, and this, this particular data point does not necessarily flesh out, are we talking mm -hmm. full-time equivalents? Yep. You know, so this, these, these are rough numbers, but mm -hmm. just to get a sense of it. So of the 10 million jobs lost, Olga, Nine million are in the service sector. Hmm. Nine million wow. in the service sector. And as Emily alluded to, and just want to highlight it, those are predominantly jobs held by women, by women yeah. of color. And so if you are a white male, white collar worker in this economy, you really not, you have not suffered much at all in this mm -hmm. pandemic. And so, you know, just to put it in really stark terms, so I actually... Yes, exactly. Economically. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Economically. I, I cannot speak to all the other issues, but in terms of like literally putting food on the table, that kind of thing, and not losing your health insurance, let's say. That's like a whole <laughs> thing that we can talk about here, which is like... Well, a lot of those service workers likely didn't have health insurance from their employers in the first place. So that's something. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can't lose what you never had. <laughs> um, and so but what that means is that people who were laid off are likely people who did not have that whole rest of the safety net, right? right like they right, did not have right. sick time. They did not have family leave time. They likely did not have severance packages. They didn't, right. it's a very different thing to be laid off from a white collar job than to be laid off from a service mm -hmm. sector job. And mm -hmm. often we know that service sector jobs um, have very different relationships to unemployment insurance than mm -hmm. white collar jobs do because proving employment and wages is very, much more complex. One other thread that would be lost, but I think it's important for, for Vermonters to understand is that it is, um, it is a double-edged sword. Maybe that's not the right uh, metaphor, but so we, we lost a lot of retail uh, purchasing tax revenue, mm -hmm. okay, here in Vermont. A lot of that during the pandemic shifted to online sales. Right. And as, as Emily said, people had, many people had income, disposable income they didn't have before because they weren't going out, they weren't going to the movies, they weren't to those things, they were spending it on more durable goods. Because we were able to finally tax those online sales, that's one of the reasons why we're doing better than we thought we would be doing. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. not great for our local businesses who aren't getting our sales. Let's be clear. Like this is a continued hit that they're taking, but in the broader picture of tax revenue, mm -hmm. it is allowing us to weather the storm because we were able to put that tax in place. And mm -hmm. so usually tax revenue can point um, to the health of the rest of our economy or our retail economy, our service economy. And so what this means is that the tax revenues of the state are further divorced from the experience of people who are running businesses mm -hmm. in our communities, right. um, which is an interesting trend that we're going to really need to keep a close eye on. And while we're here, just reminding folks that you can still order online from your local retailer. Mm -hmm. Almost mm -hmm. all of them have, um, there's been a lot of effort, a lot of really quality technical assistance from our downtown business alliance, from our um, regional business organizations to help mm -hmm. those businesses transition to online. So I can call any of the bookstores in my community and order books from them and they will either mail them to me or I can pick them up. Um, that's true for right. like the thrift, even for the um, consignment stores that I, you know, previously shopped at. So um mm -hmm. It's certainly easier to, since we're recording this on Black Friday, it's certainly easier to press go on your Amazon, um, but the service on the other end will not be as friendly. And the workers will, um, well, I think they're on strike today, actually, globally <laughs> from Amazon. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, we have just about five minutes left and I wanna turn this last question over to Becca, and I'm sure we have so much more to talk about with the legislative session, but, you know, key to so much of what we talk about on this show, Becca, and I think key mm -hmm. to one of the huge influences on policy in general is, as you mentioned at the top of the show, the stories we tell about ourselves. Yeah. What are some stories that are being told in Montpelier or Vermont in general right now that you feel just need to go because they are no longer reflecting who we actually are? Love that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't wait to hear the answer. I know, and so I could take this in so many different directions. Um, I think I'm gonna go all in on something that I know is- Please do. It is hard for many of us to talk about. It came up pretty passionately at the Thanksgiving dinner at my house last night. So it was my, my immediate family and their grandmother who is in our, our, our pod here in, in Brattleboro. Um, we were talking about what does it mean that thousands and thousands more Vermonters voted for President Trump this time around than they did in 2016. What does that yeah. tell us? And so 
I want to just like center us in the fact that there are so many truths, right? There, there, there are sometimes um, truths that seem to be in, in conflict with each other or we feel like we can only hold one of them. Yes, it is true that this administration uh, does more than just, you know, flirts with fascism. Okay, that is true. There have been dog whistles through the entire uh, 2016 election up through the presidency, racist, xenophobic, absolutely uh, Islamophobic, just being mean spirited and also um, disparaging of anyone with um, talent and experience in government. Okay, all those things are true. However, there is also a thread of this of that is my guy. I hear this all the time. That is my guy. Trump is my guy. What does that mean when we deconstruct it? Is it, I'm afraid I'm losing my power. That is true. Whether it is, you know, whether you're cognizant of the fact that that is uh, imbued with ideas around race and class. Absolutely. And, and gender, which whew, can get into that too. Right. But that is true. There is a fear of loss of control, loss of power. There is also a narrative that we need to dive into, which is fear of um, those without a college education, fear that there is no longer a place for them in our economy. That does not excuse racism. It does not excuse white supremacism. It does not excuse any of that. But in order to make connections with people who are feeling that way, it has to be rooted in our acknowledgement that it essentially comes from a place of fear and anxiety. And I know that many of my friends, um, some of whom are, are in my own you know, political party, have a hard time holding both because they feel like if they hold both, it's excusing the incredible hatred that some in that a uh, group of people feel towards the other. That is absolutely true. But as I pointed out to my children last night, there are many people who vote who actually don't pay attention a whole lot to politics, to policy. It is about how they ultimately, how they feel about their place in the world. And I want to challenge us to have a more complicated assessment of what is going on mm -hmm. for people in rural Vermont. I know, Emily, you think about these things all the time, so I don't want to take up all the time. That's one story that I'm really thinking carefully about. And as you know, I think, Olga, I, I have a motorcycle, I ride a motorcycle, and that one signal to voters has allowed me to connect with people who probably never would have connected to me as someone on the left, white, gay woman who, you know, seems to be, um, you know, fairly privileged. That one marker, it's amazing how many people have reached out to me and say, I know that, you know, they say it in their own way, but I know you get me because you ride a motorcycle. Like that one basic thing that you're not judging me, that we have that in common and we're moving beyond judgment. So Emily, jump in here. You're going to make it much more beautiful. <laughs> that is definitely not true at all. Um, <laughs> I, I just you know, mean you have a lovely use of language. Thank you, dear. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I really, you know, we've seen these threat. we've seen threads and resurgences of populism mm -hmm. across, you know, decades sure. and decades and decades um, yeah. in times of struggle and they don't have to be financial struggle. Um, there are times of change. And I right. think what's really important is that the flavor of populism of Trump is terrifying and fascist and populism yes. can be terrifying and fascist and it often is globally. Right. It doesn't have to be though. And so Democrats are also capable of populism. Mm -hmm. And it means just, you know, it's about being conscious of elite structures and about the needs of the many rather than the few. It's not, it's about true democracy and really listening to people. And so I think that 
the feelings, like the feeling state that lead people to vote towards a populist candidate yeah. is about, um, it's not about rural and urban. It's not even about class. It's about experiences that can come from any aspect of life of feeling disconnected from people who are making decisions. And as you know, economic disparities continue to grow as mm -hmm. um, the stories we tell about political differences continue to grow, the more people will feel sort of disconnected from the people making decisions. And so I think as um, Democrats, as progressives, as Vermonters, we have a decision to make on how we want to resonate with those conversations and what is possible. And I think Vermont more than anywhere else with this other myth that we have around town meeting and participatory democracy that we're, you know, not actually doing that well on following through on. Um, I think we have a real opportunity to build up that piece of our state and that conversation that we have as a state in order to have a populism that actually does serve mm -hmm. people across, um, across identity, across class, and can actually make us stronger rather than um, weaker the way, say, a totalitarian populism would. And I think, sorry, I'll, are we out of time? We technically we are started with this. So let me just say quickly so we can do it for the radio. Thank you so much for joining us today. We will be back next week, Friday at 2 p.m. But if you want to hear what Becca is about to say next, head over to our SoundCloud page and you can hear the rest of the, the interview. Have a great weekend, everyone. Go Becca. You can keep going. We're still recording. Okay. So here's... Here's um, one of the things I was talking to my family about last night. Um, a couple months ago, uh, a constituent called me and he was irate. He was just, if, if he had been you know, in, in the room with me, I think I literally would have seen foam coming out of his mouth. He was, he was so, so angry. And it doesn't matter what the issue was. It, it mattered what he, he said to me at one point. And he said, and you, you government types, you know, yeah, you're not, you're not listening and you're so elite and how much money do you make? And I said, well, um, sir, I make $14,000 a year and I work all the time at this. And he said, oh, $14,000, well, that's, that's not that much money. Like, wow, wow. And then he said, why do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> I want this to happen to me so badly. <laughs> and so I love it because, right? And that is also a story, right? That we tell about people in government. And as Emily said, we don't always live up to our ideals, whether it is about town meeting or representational government. But it also is true that when I run to the price shopper here in Brattleboro at seven o'clock on a Monday morning, cause we're out of milk, anyone can stop me. And they do and say, I wanna talk to you about this thing or what's happening with this program. Even if it's not something I'm directly you know, in charge of, I can try to get them to the right, right person. There is much more access to elected officials here in Vermont than in many other states. That doesn't mean it's perfect. It doesn't mean that we still don't have a long way to go to make it more accessible. But I do think there is an opportunity that we have here to truly lift the curtain and demystify mm -hmm. the, the work that we're doing. And this pandemic is giving us some tools to do that, whether it's Zoom, whether it is you know, shows like this that will live on beyond you know, the, the life of just appearing on, on a radio show. And so it is, it is important for all of us at every step of the way in government to point out to people the flaws in the system, but also say, you know what though? We do a lot right mm -hmm. here in Vermont that mm -hmm. you don't need to be a millionaire to run to be a house rep or a senator or even statewide office here in Vermont. 
there is there is no political machine here in the way there is in New York or California or Massachusetts. And so that's mm -hmm. real. That's not just a story that that is real. And that's really meaningful to me or else I wouldn't have this job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. It just always flies by. I but know. I, How would people I, find you if they want to talk more or learn more? They should call me. Do you do you have a do you have a website? <laughs> I do. I do have a website. Start cool. with that. That's great. Yeah. What's your website? Beccabalant.com. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I haven't had my second cup of coffee yet this morning. No, me either. That's okay. We couldn't tell actually. Oh, yeah. Not until just then. <laughs> Not yeah. until you fessed up. Yeah. Um, Emily, if people have questions for you, if they want to find you, where can they find you? They can find me at emilycornheiser.org where they can find a link to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, phone number, mailing address, um, any of those places or every Saturday at 10 a.m. on the Zoom for a community conversation. And I really hope people will join me for that. It's almost as fun as this. Thank you, Emily. And this is the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW, LP Brattleboro Community Radio Station. You can also find us on the Vermontitude Facebook page, the Vermontitude SoundCloud page, and Brattleboro Community Television, which we have to announce, Emily. Oh, I didn't know if we were allowed to. We are. Well, since we're pre-recording and the press, res the press res uh, release thank you, uh -huh. has gone out, I think we can. Uh, the Montpelier Happy Hour has been awarded by BCTV the 2020 Series of the Year Award. So thank you. Thank you, BCTV. Thank you, community. That's exciting. It is exciting. exciting. Mm -hmm. It's so exciting. We were really honored. And they're doing the awards ceremony online on December 9th, I believe. That's so sure. great. Yeah. We're legit. Congratulations. We are. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Shall we toast our way out, Emily? We shall, but I um, have nothing in my cup. <laughs> oh, oh, no. So I'm going Mine to. Thanksgiving. Um, Toast with my hands because toasting with an un, with an empty cup is just terrible luck. So mm -hmm. um, to all the many beautiful things that we have to be thankful for, even in these very difficult times, may we come out stronger and wiser and in greater connection to each other. Here, here. Yes, please. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Becca. Thank you to all our listeners and watchers. <laughs>